Greetings, everybody. Chaplain Bob Walker here, Light of the World Ministries in John 8, 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. This is going to be part four of Saints, possibly the last one. Uh, I've got to do a uh, one another Bible study on the end times. Uh, I've got a lot of stuff to put together. I'll tell you what. The uh, way things are going, I'm kind of wondering if uh, the end of this year is it. I'm, you know, they've got everything in place. But uh, there's one thing is uh, that they're uh, kind of concerned about is the uh, amendment to the Bill of Rights, the Constitution, which is the second one. And if you don't know what that is, look it up. And uh, that's about the only thing why they haven't implemented their little uh, thing. But, yeah, we'll see. All right. Um, let's go to Ma the book of Matthew. We're going to start doing the uh, New Testament. And... Um, I guess Matthew 27, verse 46. Uh, this is the crucifixion of Jesus. Now, if you don't know it, Jesus, when he was crucified, spent three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, sign of the prophet Jonah. And uh, it wasn't until he was resurrected uh, until he ascended up to the Father in heaven. He went to... Um, the heart of the earth, which I believe was Abraham's bosom. And if you're not familiar, I've got a Bible study on three days that changed the world. Take a look at it sometime. And um, yeah, three days that changed the world. I think it's a pretty decent study. And it highlights what Jesus did for the three days when he was, well, his body was dead, I guess you could say. So, all right, verse um, Matthew 27, verse 50. Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. He died in the flesh anyways. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. Can you imagine you've been watching Jesus on the cross, and then when he dies, there was an earthquake, and the rocks were broken up. Verse 52. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints, the saints, that's what the study is about, right? Part four, the saints. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints, which slept, you know, they were dead, which slept, arose, and came out of the graves after his resurrection. So here it is. Um, <laughs> you know, after the third day when Jesus rose from the dead, those that were lovers of the Lord and trusting in him came out of their graves after the resurrection and went into the holy city, Jerusalem, and appeared unto many. Can you imagine the stories that they must have told people? See, the Bible records that Jesus went and preached when he, uh, when he died. Yeah, he did. All right, and you can find that in the book of 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. 
the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. What was Jesus doing three days when he was waiting for his to be resurrected? He was down in the prison, and the prison was um, hell. And he was pre preaching unto the spirits in prison. And some people will tell you he's preaching to the fallen angels, but I, I don't think so. But hey, that's just my opinion. Uh, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison, which sometime were disobedient, but once the long suffering of, of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. See, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Israel, and the Old Testament prophets, uh, they didn't go to heaven when they died in the Old Testament. The Messiah hadn't come. They were dead in trespass and sins. So they went to Abraham's bosom. You could read about that. The rich man and Lazarus. I did an entire Bible study on that, which I think is very interesting. You know, the Bible gives you little breadcrumbs here and there. And, you know, you got to kind of collect all the breadcrumbs and put them together and then kind of figure out what's going on. So, all right. So, and the graves are open and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. You see, after they Christ went to the prison, Abraham's bosom, hell, uh, he preached to them and told them, hey, I'm the Messiah, believe in me and, you know, you'll live. And, of course, they would. And, uh, and the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared unto many. And I can only imagine the stories that these people told. Oh, yeah, my name is uh, Jim Eliah, and I've been in the grave for 1,500 years waiting for the Messiah, you know. And, uh, and then Jesus preached to us, and here I am. And, you know, the Pharisees would uh, want to have all these people killed. Yeah. Verse 54, now when the centurion... The Roman soldier and they that were with him watching Jesus saw the earthquake and those things that were done they feared greatly saying truly this was the Son of God seeing even an unsaved Roman soldier had more sense than those well-educated Pharisees all right let's go to Acts chapter 9 and if you do not believe the saints are Christians, well, Acts chapter 9 is going to put the nail in the coffin of those that teach that the saints are not Christians. All right, Acts chapter 9 and verse 1. And Saul... I remember Saul had his name changed to Paul. And, you know, people that deny Paul's writings, you know, right here, they're telling you that the book of Acts is wrong. Can you imagine that? They're going to tell you that not only is Paul's writings no good, but the book of Acts is no good either. Figure that one out. Well thing is they don't like Jesus oh wait they don't use the name Jesus they use uh, Yeshua or Yahashua or Yahahahahashua or whatever yeah it's the same crowd because really they don't like Jesus they hate him and uh, you know when the Antichrist comes the man of sin the son of perdition the beast whatever name you want to call him the Bible uses all four of those names, by the way. Um, 
Oh, and the son of perdition has only been used twice in the Bible. Judas Iscariot was one. And then the man of sin is called the son of perdition. He's the second one. So, uh, you know, uh, what do you want to bet that he calls himself Yeshua or Yahashua or whatever? I bet you that's what they're going to call uh, the man of sin. All right, so. Acts chapter 9, verse 1. And Saul... Yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? See, Paul haters will tell you, oh, this, this is wrong. This doesn't belong in the Bible. You know, the devil added this. If anything... The devil is the one that's saying that Paul's not called of the Lord. So, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus. He didn't say, I am Yeshua HaMashiach. He said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembled and astonished and said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. You know, I always wondered, what, what about the companions here of Paul, you know, there's, we don't even know who they are. Their names are never mentioned. You know, they, they heard the voice, but they didn't see anybody. And, I, you know, and you wonder, and they're, and Paul's like, he's blind. I mean, what, uh, you know, what happened to these guys? You know, and Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Why three days? Well, Jesus was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, right? That's why my Bible study, three days it changed the world. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Ananias. Uh, let's see, hold on a second. And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the street, which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus, for behold, he prayeth. And he hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Um, does this entire does the entire book of Acts wrong? So that you can deny Paul, really? See, these Paul haters—they're really Christ haters. They really are. They hate Christ. They they hate God the Son. They hate God the Father. They hate everything, and they're of Satan. Verse 13, then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. What was Paul doing that he did evil unto the saints at Jerusalem? Uh, he's persecuting the church, those that are in Christ. It's pretty obvious who these saints are. 
They are everybody that are in Christ. Period. Hmm. You know, it's funny. How many, how many times do you hear somebody say, uh, well, I was a Jew, but now I'm a Christian. No, they always call themselves Messianic Jews. What does that mean? It means you're a Jew looking for your Messiah or the Messiah already came. Why can't, why don't, or why are they afraid? To, are they ashamed to call themselves Christians? I don't know. Somebody call the synagogue and ask and get back with me, please. You know, it, it makes you wonder. Maybe they're waiting for the Messiah to come. Another one. I don't know. I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. What name is that? Jesus. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the, in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou might, mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received a sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And Paul haters, deniers will tell you, oh, this don't belong in the Bible. This is wrong. Yeah. How about Romans 1 and verse 7? And you know, Paul haters will tell you, oh, the book of Romans, that doesn't, that doesn't belong in the Bible because Paul wrote it and he was a false apostle, they'll tell you. Romans 1, 7, to all that be in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints, called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Let's go to the next page. Go to Romans chapter 8. I guess we'll start at verse 25. Romans 8, 25. But if we hope for that, we see not. See, that's what faith is. Faith is believing and waiting for something you believe in true that is true, even though you cannot see it. Uh, but if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it? You see, you may not see the promises of God, and you wait for it with patience, right? 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us, which groanings, which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. 
You know, people, I was almost killed being rear-ended on a motorcycle on the interstate. I was probably doing 65 or 70, and a guy rear-ended me. Lord knows how fast he was going. Got some broken bones and spent some time, you know, in the hospital and got to uh, ride around in a wheelchair for a while and then crutches and a cane. And it was about a year before I could walk unassisted. And, uh, and I was told by three of the top orthopedic doctors in the county that I would never walk unassisted again. You know, without, you know, at least a cane or something. I was going to be disabled. I mean, I'm partly disabled, but, you know, I don't need a cane or anything. And uh, that ended up... That ended up uh, being what brought me back to Christ. Because I was in a doctor's office and a couple of true believers witnessed to me and um, long story, I've never really told people my um, conversion story because, you know, my story is not important. But uh, I had discovered that the medical profession, who they were and what they were doing and what an evil bunch of things was going on. And this is long, this was like back in the late 80s. I discovered their plans back in the late 80s, believe it or not. And they, they, these people told me, hey, um, all this stuff you're talking about, you know, the one world government, what coming and this and that and the other, and uh, it's in the Bible. And I just kind of rolled my eyes and go, oh boy, a bunch of Bible thumpers. But uh, the lady took a, an envelope out of her purse and uh wrote a bunch of Bible verses on it and said, go look this up. The one world government's in the Bible. The new world, you know what. And I did. And that was the night that I realized what a fool I'd been. Because, you know, I used to believe when I was in what grade? Um, eight. Yeah, eighth grade. Eighth grade, I, I believed in the Lord. Went to a private Baptist school. Grace Baptist Church, Miami, South Miami. Yep. And, um, and I realized what a fool I'd been. It took a lot of years. Well, it took a number of years for the Lord to bring me back. But, you know. But. And we know that all. All things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. So I guess I had a purpose. I don't know. Boy, it took a lot for the Lord to bring me back. I'll tell you what. But remember the story? Let's see. Let's find that story. Now, I did a Bible study on this very, very uh, topic. Forgiven with tears. And I can understand that. Luke chapter 7, verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him, Jesus, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment. And stood at his feet behind him, weeping, and began to wash his feet with tears, and did wipe them with the hairs of her head, and kissed his feet, and anointed them with the ointment. Now when the Pharisee, which had bidden him, saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed 500 pence and the other 50. 
Now remember, a pence is about a day's wage for an unskilled laborer. So 500 pence is like two years salary. So one owes 500 and the other owes 50. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him most? Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he, Jesus, turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet, but she hath washed my feet with tears, and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss, but this woman since the time I came in hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And believe me, people, you know who I relate to here? The woman. Yeah. I, I, I could understand how she must have felt. Being forgiven much. Oh, yeah. All right, let's read 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 1. Now, remember, Corinthians were residents of the church at the city of Corinth, a, church, a, a city in Greece. You know, the New Testament was written in Greek. Don't fall for that garbage where uh, they tell you that the New Testament was originally in Hebrew and then mistranslated into Greek. No, no, the New Testament was always in Greek. Matter of fact, who was it that killed Jesus? Who was it that killed the saints? Who was it that killed the Christians and the apostles? Wasn't the Greeks and it wasn't the Romans. No. It was the you-know-whos. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God and Sothenes, our brother. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints. The church, those that are in Christ are the saints. Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place, call upon the name of Yeshua HaMashiach? No. Call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ. All right, in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, it says, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. You notice it's not the synagogue of the saints. It's the churches of the saints. How about Philippians 1.1? 1, 1? Um, Philippi was a city in Greece. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. 
All right, let's go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. I guess verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you, for all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might per perfect that which is lacking in your faith, now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you, and the Lord make you to increase and abound in love one toward another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. See, at the second coming, Christ is coming with an army of his angels and with his saints, those that died in Christ. Well, actually, there's going to be a small remnant, remnant of people who never taste of death. Uh, those that are alive during when Christ returns, they're just going to be transformed from a terrestrial body to a celestial body, from an earthly to a spiritual body. They'll never see death in the physical sense. There is actually going to be a, a remnant of people like that. Who knows, those listening to my voice right now, we might actually, some of us might actually um, see that day happen. And let me tell you something, people. Things are going to get bad. I mean, really, really bad. You know, the church thinks they're going to fly away any second and not see any bad stuff because they're going to pre-trib rapture out of here. You know, by the time they figure out that they've been lied to and that they might have to suffer and die for their faith in Christ, um, I think it's, what is it, Ro Hebrews? I think it's Hebrews chapter 9, the, the faith chapter. People are going to be longing, begging, begging for the Lord to return. That's how bad things are going to be. Yeah. They're going to be begging. But uh, right now, the church world, so-called, they, they have no clue. You know, it was Schofield that uh, popularized the pre-trib rapture garbage. And when you investigate his life, um, now, I know... That when people come to the Lord, their lives change. But from what I understand, Schofield's life never changed. And that guy was a slime ball from the beginning. Even when he was wealthy from the sales of hundreds of thousands of his books, he never contributed a penny of support to his children. And this was his two daughters saying this. This isn't Bob Walker saying this. This is his two daughters saying this. He cheated his mother-in-law out of her life savings. Did he pay her back when he made money? No. No, never did. Guy was a slime ball. And yet people revere this guy as some kind of saint. Yeah, more like a devil. But hey, what do I know? All right, um, let's see. In the book of Jude, verse 14, it says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. Yep, Lord's going to come with his army, army of angels and an army of his saints. And I hope I'm counted worthy to be one of them 
And I hope the Lord gives me a flaming sword. I won't need a, a Jedi lightsaber. I'm going to have a hopefully have a flaming sword. You know, Star Wars. That's a Star Wars reference. Yeah. You know, Jedi lightsaber, whatever they call it. What a, yeah. All right. Let's go to Revelation. Chapter 5. All right, Revelation 5 and verse 1. And I saw on the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? And I'm kind of wondering, is this the book of life? Verse 3. And no man in heaven, nor on earth, nor under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not, behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent forth into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. Do you know the prayers of saints are like incense unto the Lord? Full of odors? Yeah. Who are these four and twenty elders? Well, I did a Bible study on that. And Bob's not the final authority, but if an angel were to come to me and ask me, hey, uh, who do you think these four and twenty elders are? I would say, well, I think it's the uh, twelve are the uh, yeah the twelve tribes of Israel, you know Judah, Reuben, uh, Simeon, Levi, uh, Naphtali, uh, you know twelve the twelve tribes of Israel, and the twelve apostles, minus Judas Iscariot, plus Paul. That's twelve plus thirteen minus one. Yeah, 24, right? And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God, and thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. Reign, R-E-I-G-N, ruling and reigning, uh, not water falling from the sky, okay? And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands. That's probably everybody from the time of Adam until the last person dies at the end of the tribulation. 10,000 times 10,000. That's a lot of zeros, people. And thousands of thousands. All right, Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. And when he had opened the seventh seal, 
There was silence in heaven about the space of half an hour. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Um, guess what, people? The tribulation is going on. And um, yeah, let's take a look at something real quick. You know, if pre-tribbers would bother to read their Bible instead of listening to lying preachers and uh, Schofield notes, they would know that in 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 52, Paul writes, and this is another reason why they hate Paul, it says, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. Now, if there are seven trumps or seven trumpets in the book of Revelation, which one do you think is the last one? Oh, the one before the, uh, the tribulation. Yeah, that's the last trump, the pre-tribbers will tell you. What? What? Now, if there's seven of them, uh, the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth is not the last one. That's like Z is the last letter in the alphabet, but uh, the pre-trib rapture is at the letter A. Because, you know, yeah, you, you, pretzel logic. These are the people that are going to betray you. These are the people that will deny Jesus when it comes time to die for the faith. They never bothered to read the book of Acts where the saints were dying for their faith, for the name of Jesus. No, they, they are, they're too good for that. In a moment, in the twinkle of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. You see, until the seventh trump happens, there is no resurrection of the dead. We're not going to be changed until the seventh trump at the end of the tribulation. And that's how it works, people. That's how it works. Verse 2, Revelation 8. And I saw the seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar, having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of all saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. And people, this is where the wrath of God happens. And the pre-trippers will say, well, we're not subject to God's wrath. That's right, you're not. Just like when God's wrath was poured out against Egypt, Israel was in Egypt, but they didn't have the plagues. They didn't have the hail with fire and, and the darkness and the flies and the lice and the frogs. They didn't have it. They were there, but it didn't touch them. Yeah. It'll be the same thing in the tribulation. God's people will not be subject to God's wrath. Unless, of course, you follow Babylon, take the mark of the beast, and worship his image, and then you got a problem. Big problem. Something you'll re regret for the rest of your existence. All right, let's go to Revelation chapter 13. Boy, I've read this. I have read this chapter so many times. Oh, boy. Verse 1, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast 
a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns and upon its horns ten crowns and upon its heads the name of blasphemy blasphemy and the beast which i saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion yeah he speaks like uh he's going to try to speak like the the lion of the tribe of judah but he's not and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority um satan's seat is mentioned in the book of revelation and uh, i looked up the city and it was in turkey yeah isn't that interesting huh and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority and i saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast and uh satan's seat is in revelation chapter 2 verse 12 and to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, Pergamos, is this, it's in Turkey now. Well, before it was called Turkey, before these those peace-loving uh, Ottoman Turk Muslims invaded uh, what is now called Turkey, it was called Greece. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things saith he which hath the sharp sword with two edges. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is. What is Satan's seat? His throne. Was it Pergamos? Wow. Yeah. I know thy works and where thou dwellest, even where Satan's seat is, and thou holdest fast my name and hast not denied my faith. Even in those days where in Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelleth. Yeah. Where Satan dwelleth. Uh, can you imagine living in Satan's neighborhood? What a rough neighborhood that would be, huh? Yeah. Well, it was Greece back in the days of John. Now it's called Turkey. The Ottoman Turks, they're a type of Muslims. And by the way, um, the Ottoman Turks and the you know who's are friends. Don't let anybody ever tell you otherwise. They're not enemies. Matter of fact, they're probably cousins, kissing cousins. So, and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard and his feet were as the feet of a bear and his mouth as the mouth of a lion and the dragon gave him power and his seat and great authority revelation 2 uh, 13 verse 3 and i saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death and his deadly wound was healed and all the world wondered after the beast and they worshiped the dragon which gave power unto the beast and they worshiped the beast saying who is like unto the beast who is able to make war with him and there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Verse 7. And it was given unto him to make war. War. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them sounds like the devil's going to be kicking the saints rear ends oh yeah tell this to the pre-tribbers and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them and power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations The devil's going to have complete control over the earth, over all kindreds, tongues, and nations, all over. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of the life, 
in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. Are your names written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world? Were our names written in the book of life from the foundation of the world? Uh, it makes you wonder. All right, let's let's uh, see what else we got. All right, let's read uh, Revelation chapter 14. I guess we'll, um, yeah, we'll read the whole chapter, I guess. Verse 1, And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. Hmm. Would you rather have God the Father's name written in your forehead or the mark of the beast? Oh, boy, tough choice, huh? And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the forty, the hundred and forty and four thousand, which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Boy, that counts me out. These are they which follow the Lamb whither, whithersoever he goeth. They were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come, and worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. And there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Why say fallen twice? Well, I believe once physically and once spiritually. Babylon has fallen, has fallen, that great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And if you don't know who Babylon is, there's a guy called Chris White, and I did a study on it too, where he correctly identifies Babylon. And no, it's not Rome, and no, it's not New York City, and no, it's not Mecca. Yeah. Verse 9. And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Mmm. You know, I've had people tell me, Yeah, I've actually heard, uh, had people say that, well, you know, God will understand if I take the mark of the beast because I got to feed my family. You know, I got to feed my little children, so God will understand if I take the mark of the beast. Really? You trusted the beast, Satan, to um, feed your family, but you couldn't trust the Lord to do it? Really? Really? You can't trust the Lord to feed your family? When Israel left Egypt and they wandered into the wilderness for 40 years, what did they eat? God supplied them with manna and quail for a little while there. Yeah. The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. Uh, the wrath of God's going to be poured out full strength, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. You know what indignation means? It means extreme 
hatred. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his, his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Here is the patience of the saints. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Here you go. Do you have the faith of Jesus? Do you keep the commandments of God? And I'm not talking about keeping the Sabbath day. No, no, no. What did Jesus say? The uh, Jesus said, A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. Yeah. What did Jesus say were the, the two commandments? The great commandment in the law was to love the Lord with all thy heart and all thy mind and all thy soul. And the second is like unto it. Uh, love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And I kind of paraphrase that, but you get the idea. Love the Lord and love thy neighbor. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Yeah. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth, yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. And I looked and behold a white cloud and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man having on his head a golden crown and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. Oh yeah. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth and the earth was reaped. Hmm. You know, this is when the Lord comes for his people. And you're either going to be on the right hand or the left. You're either in Christ or you're not. Period. And another angel came out of the temple, which is in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle and another angel came out from the altar, which had power over fire and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle saying, thrust in thy sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the wine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press of the wrath of God. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress even unto the horse's bridles by the space of a thousand and six hundred furlongs. There's going to be so much blood shed upon the earth, it's going to go up to the horse's bridle. How high is that? Uh, I don't know, but it's probably a foot or two. Now that's a space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. That's... That's a big area. Of course, you know, 7 billion people, the blood of 7 billion people. Yeah, something like that. So, all right, uh, let's go to the next chapter. 15. And I saw another sign in heaven, great marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. 
And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God. You know what? There was a song of Moses in the Old Testament. I think it was in the book of Leviticus. I'm not sure. Uh, let me pause real quick. Nope, I was wrong. It's in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 31. And in verse 22, it says, And Bar Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it the children of Israel. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, verse 44. And Moses came and spake all the words of this song in the ears of the people, he and Hoshea, the son of Nun. Um, and then also in Exodus 15, 1. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Yeah, speaking of when uh, Pharaoh tried to follow Israel through the Red Sea, and then, you know, Israel, the, the sea parted, and they went across dry land, and when Moses uh, saw Pharaoh's army following them, and then the last Israelite crossed over, the sea closed up against them and drowned them all. That's why you don't you don't mess with the Lord. So, all right, verse three of Revelation fifteen, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, "Great, marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints." Who shall not fear thee, O Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. For all nations shall come and worship before thee, for thy judgments are made manifest. And after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was opened. And the seven angels came out of the temples, having the seven plagues, clothed in pure and white linen, and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. Uh, and one of the four beasts gave unto the seven angels seven golden vials full of the wrath of God who liveth forever and ever. Uh, and the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no man was able to enter into the table till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. So, Revelation 15, 3, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great, marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. And that, people, is the conclusion of part four of saints. And I think the next Bible study I'm going to do is not so much a Bible study, but just kind of current events tied in with Bible prophecy. Um, is this it? Is this, you know. Boy, I tell you what, the um, trap is ready to be sprung. And they're on it. So, all blessings, praise, glory, and honor. To God the Father and His only begotten Son, Jesus, who is the Christ, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. All blessings, praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' precious name. Amen.